Greetings, true believers. It is I, Matt Hall from Hidden Machine, here today with another interview. That's right, we've got a growing series of interviews we've been doing here on the channel with people who work in and around the games industry. And today I want to present to you a chat that I recently had with a composer named Barry Leach. Now, if you don't know Barry by name, you might still know some of his tracks. He's worked on games on pretty much every major platform from the mid to late 80s up until today. And he also has a lot of credits doing sound for various toys. And we had a pretty interesting chat. Now, I've seen other interviews with him and they kind of covered, you know, how did you come up? What did you first do? This and that. And so to kind of try and do something a little bit different, I wanted to talk more about music in general, uh, talk more about some of the more technical aspects of how certain jobs got done for music production throughout the, you know, mid to late 80s to 90s and how things kind of changed as we went away from, you know, chiptune music to full CD audio and all that kind of stuff. We also had some interesting talk about sampling, which is a topic near and dear to my heart as a, you know, hip hop head beat maker guy. And I love hearing sampling and music. So some interesting stuff was covered in this interview and I'm excited to share it with you. Of course, first, I want to thank all of our supporters over on Patreon and the channel members here on YouTube for helping to keep the channel going. You really inspire me with your support. And uh, I know Jordan feels the same way. So thank you from the bottom of both of our hearts for continuing to support Hidden Machine and for checking out today's video. Again, this is a chat with Barry Leach that I had recently, and I'm excited for you to check it out. So let's get into the already in progress chat between myself and Mr. Barry Leach. I was familiar with your music already from many games. <laughs> Which ones do you remember most? Well, one of my favorite games is Weird Dreams. Um, I'm not sure if you did the if you if you composed that or if you just uh No, I just converted it. It was David Whitaker did the original ones on the uh, try to think which one he did. I got stuck with the conversions. He did the Amiga and the ST, I believe. And I had to do the PC and something else. So the Commodore, I think. So so I had to do the Dance of the Sugar Plum Fairy, which <laughs> is a hell of a complex piece. <laughs> And at the time, I mean, I was like 18 years old at the time. There's no way I could work that out by ear what it was playing, you know. And I had to go buy the sheet music. I had to go get a train <laughs> 30 miles to Leeds to buy the sheet music. Also, one of my favorite games, and again, was uh, San Francisco Rush 2049. Yeah, that was a good game. I like that. On the Dreamcast especially, it was. Uh, oh. I used to play that with the kids. I've only played the N64 one. Yeah. Dreamcast one's a little smoother. I, I would imagine, yeah. Huh, I'll have to check that out. I didn't know that got ported. I've heard you say in interviews that you've done most of your music in a tracker. Yeah, yeah. I like sequence of trackers fast. It's like for someone who doesn't know anything about trackers, can you just give like a like a rudimentary explanation of what that is? Well, it's I mean, you're familiar I mean when you write in Cakewalk or Sonar, Cubase, whatever, you're writing horizontally and trackers just turn it on its side. And it's uh, it's more of a step time editor, uh, like uh, like those drum machines. The the light follows along, and you tap on the things it's like that. Except you can expand the resolution to to whatever you want. So, and this is always this is kind of you know interesting to me because I I play music, but when I'm composing a lot of like bigger pieces, I use a step sequencer, which is kind of like a simplified tracker. Um. And I, I have found that it's just so much faster for me to get my ideas out when I can, and I, I can play things that in the sequencer that I, I, can, I, can, I can plunk it out on a keyboard if I need to, but I can't really play with the same proficiency. And, and so it's nice to just have this kind of uh, barrier between, you know, my own limitations and the ideas in my head. It's getting those ideas down is the most important part. Because you get interrupted with a phone call or something, and you're like, "Oh my god, I was just in the middle of something." Have you? Did you start on a on a tracker, or did you start with you know other types of instruments and started? Well, I mean, I, the the first sequencer I ever used was electro. Well, before electro sound, it was things like sound monitor and stuff, um, where you were typing in the hex values, and then electro sound came out on the Commodore sixty four, which was a, a Step time editor, but it was a terrible piece of software. It didn't have uh, 
it didn't have any of the features that anybody that had a custom music driver had at the time, like arpeggios and stuff. Uh, and you could fudge it by speeding up your music to full speed and then just playing hundreds and thousands of notes, which is pretty much what I did for a couple of demo tunes back then. But uh, yeah, from there, I, I finally got a music driver. And so it was typing in music in hexadecimal on text editors and stuff, compiling and that was how we continued on with like the Atari ST and Spectrum, Amstrad, all those. Uh, but the Amiga trackers came out on the, the trackers first came out on the Amiga, and so that was where uh, where I really got into them. It was like, holy, you know, this is a great way to write music. You can just put something together really quickly. You can get your idea down before you forget it or get sidetracked. Yeah, the the Amiga especially has really good sound. Uh, you know, compared to a lot of other contemporary systems, like, do you have a favorite platform from, you know, back in the day? Like, yeah, well, I mean, back then, I mean, you, you had your, your, your Amiga had samples and then the Super Nintendo had samples, but it was only really, only had like 24 kilobytes of chip space or something horrible to use. So that was really tough to work with. And then the Genesis was FM based and, uh, the the PC ones, the AdLib card was FM based also, Sound Blaster. But there was the Roland MT32, it was a lovely piece of gear. Um, it, it was basically the precursor to the, the JV series of synthesizers. Um, it was about a quarter of the horsepower of one of those. And we had a, our own custom editor written in, uh, when I was at Magitech in Ocean. There was a programmer by the name of Leslie Long. He wrote this... Uh, this tracker that I designed and uh, with a full instrument editor for the MT32. Mm. And it was really, really satisfying. There's copies of it knocking around. I released it about 10, 15 years ago. So if, if you if you get a copy of DOSBox, you can suffer through. <laughs> That's cool. Um, so you mentioned earlier that, you know, for a game like Weird Dreams, uh, David Whitaker composed the pieces for, well, for the most part. Um but when you were tasked with doing the conversions on music like that, how much sort of, you know, um, liberty were you given? Because I, I noticed even with like the title composition uh, between the different versions of, I don't, I don't mean to focus so much on Weird Dreams, I just love that game. <laughs> but I noticed, you know, that in different versions, like you're, you're taking liberties with the tempo and some of the changes and the music and you know, what kind of oversight was there for that stuff? None, little to none. And I was just learning as a composer at the time. I mean, I was, I'd only been composing a couple of years, I think, when I did uh, Weird Dreams. And so, yeah, that was 89. Yeah, I hadn't developed much in the way of an ear by then. Um, so, transcribing stuff note for note was a pain in the ass. It was, it, and I didn't have, it wasn't like I had a synthesizer or a keyboard in my room. I must have my office. It was, uh, it was just a, I was sat there with a computer trying to work it out, transcribe it from, our, from an Amiga game that you couldn't pause the music or anything. You know, you could load the game and it would just play. And you had to try <laughs> right. and work out what it was with no keyboard. So I, I would just take artistic license and make things up. I mean, and sometimes it's the technology. I mean, when I did Gauntlet Legends, um, John Paul had written this huge score for the arcade version. And I had to smoosh that all down to the Nintendo 64 into, you know, so I'm going from John's uh, Pro Tools uh, file, you know, where he has 24 or 32 tracks, and I've got eight on the, the, the Super <laughs> Nintendo, eight or 12, or whatever it was, or the, the Nintendo 64. And so there was times when I would just, no, I, I would just scrub a piece of his music and just write something new in the in the same style, roughly the same. Okay. Yeah. I've always been curious about that because I, you know, sometimes it's, sometimes it is just stripped down one for one with the original. And then sometimes it is pretty different. And, uh, I don't know. I, I've, I've been curious too, like going from like for that game again. So you did the DOS and the C64 version. Like, I guess what I'm trying to say is like, what was it like trying to jump from doing uh, the same score for multiple platforms? You know, like... Well, usually I, I would write it on the Amiga and I would bear in mind when I was writing things that uh, that, I that would be converting it to the Atari ST or the Spectrum Amstrad that all had the AY chips. So I would 
right it so I knew, or I was thinking ahead that I could squeeze, uh, you know, like on on the Amiga, I might have a drum track, a bass track, a backing arpeggio, and a melody. You know, use the four channels. Knowing the Atari ST's only got three, so what am I going to lose? And it's like, well, if I can, I could if if I make the drum track pretty simple on the uh, pr- pretty simple on the Amiga, um, I can fudge it on the Atari ST just by putting a little bit of white noise before every note for like a for a hi hat line. And then I could drop a couple of notes in the arpeggio, squeeze a kick and snare in there. And oh, wow. Things like that. Yeah. Or, or you know, s- squeeze the snare into the arpeggio line, but put the kick drum on the bass line or something. That's so fascinating to me. To, you know, because I, I, now that you say that, I totally can hear how those rhythms get approximated, but I never thought of the actual you know, process behind doing it. Yeah, it's squeeze it in wherever you could. Yeah. And, and these days... <laughs> I did a piece of music for the Spectrum Next. I think it was uh, uh, Dungeonette, and and the music driver they have for that, you know, they have a full, they 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 have n- now you have a full PC editor that can create uh, the most advanced piece of Spectrum music you ever could. It, it's the driver has all these crazy little effects where you can uh, you can actually still play a bass note, but it's got it, it plays a little kick drum sound at the beginning of the bass note. Mm. So and you can just keep squeezing in things like that. It's quite fascinating to see how far people took it. Yeah, I I wanted to ask you something too about sampling. And you mentioned, I mean, the sample size on a lot of early systems was very small. Games like Hero Quest. I mean, I think the in-game music is uh, is about seven minutes of music, and it fits in like thirty kilobytes, thirty-five kilobytes, somewhere around. There. It's tiny. I'm curious about. Um, kind of the early days of sampling. I, I've, I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of sampling. I, I'm, I make music. I like, I like to, you know, I like composing for chiptune type stuff, but also I love sampling and just hearing different creative ways and, and kind of working within certain constraints uh, can just be so rewarding. You know, if you, if you really get something cool out of, you know, almost nothing. And I, I I'm curious, like what, was it kind of like an outlaw kind of thing? Like, were you, kind of able to sample whatever well i mean there was no laws or anything regarding sampling back then i mean i remember when we first got a sampler at work i mean this was probably 1990 1991 someone finally bought a piece of audio hardware (laughs) and uh so what i did was i went around everybody in the office i grabbed all their cds and stuff and uh just trying to sample little drum little drums or a- anything I could from the CDs that was usable. And there was a there was a game I did called Lotus 2 on the Amiga. Mm-hmm. And you can hear that the the cuz cuz there's little bits of yellows oh yeah in in there uh the the chick 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 sounds I used those and pump up the jam because there was some chords at the beginning of a uh Someone had a, a CD of like the the twelve inch remixes of uh, Pump Up the Jam, nice. and I had a little, a little bit with the keyboards. I could sample those, and, and so then I went on and created a tune out of those. That's cool. I mean, yeah, I've talked to a lot of people who did very similar stuff in hip hop and dance music, and it's just cool to see it mirrored in game music too. Um, yeah, and, and and you see the videos of people recreating like uh, the Prodigy tracks. Mm. I'll breathe or smack my bitch up and stuff and it's uh it's, it's incredible how they go and find these original samples that they got and then what they did to them you know whether they processed it or reversed it or i know sometimes you think you've covered your tracks enough and it's like <laughs> people have gotten very good with that i've noticed yeah. a similar thing with people uh finding all of the texture samples for you know like n64 games and you know finding just like a photograph of a window <laughs> that mm. You know, somehow, thirty years later, someone goes, "Oh, there, there's the source." Um, so with with sampling, um, uh, for something like the uh, Apache Longbow soundtrack, um, there's a lot of guitar on that. Yeah, how do you do those sounds? Well, those were uh, I actually had a live guitarist for that. Oh. One, one of the other composers at Origin, uh, Stretch Williams, he played guitar. And so it was like, hey, Stretch, I've been trying to write tunes here with the synth guitar, and it sounds shitty. So <laughs> come on in, spend 20 minutes just 
play some crazy stuff. Have you done much with like a synth guitar or sample guitar? Yeah, I've done loads. I mean, the, the Horizon Chase Turbo was uh, pretty much all uh, synth guitar. Although I did get uh, a guitarist, Ryan Chin, um, very talented guitarist. He uh, he laid down some tracks for the title when I remastered the title version for for the Turbo version. And then on Horizon Chase 2, I had Paolo Borer, uh, Aquarius' in-house audio guy. He he was working as producer, so he, he replaced all my synth guitar with live guitar. <laughs> He's a great guitarist. He's a good ear. Great ear. That's cool. Yeah, I've, I've, I've done some similar stuff and had people kind of go in and go, I it's going to be much better if you can just play this. <laughs> Sometimes it is, I mean, but other times, you know, you, you get used to that synth guitar and it depends what you're trying to get, you know, the textures and stuff. Yeah, I'm always impressed by someone who can kind of get the, you know, the more nuanced articulations of like a lead guitar. Because like a, the rhythm guitar or the power chords can kind of sound great sampled, but... When I hear someone able to really massage those notes to, you know, really make it breathe, it's always so impressive. It's also hard to get a guitarist just to play what you wrote as well. Yeah. Because they're always embellishing it and stuff. And it's like, dude, nobody wants to hear a seven minute solo, two, <laughs> you know, 20 seconds into the tune. We've got to establish the melody, then you do your variations. Right. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> You turned me on to a game that you worked on recently uh, called Swivel. Mm -hmm. uh, for anyone that doesn't know, it's a VR game where you're in a swivel chair. And it's it's like a rhythm game. And you're kind of doing movements. And you're uh, it, it really feels like you're like kind of conducting the song a lot of the time, to me, in my experience, it, especially on the classical track. Um, but I, I read that this was your first time working with a vocalist like this and writing full songs for a game like lyrics and all, right? Is that? It was the first time I'd written full songs for for a game. It was the first. It was my first VR title, which I was excited about. Um, because I've, I mean, I've worked on so many platforms. I think I've I think I've written music on more platforms than anyone else on the planet. It was ridiculous. <laughs> I it. believe it. I mean, just just because you include all the old video game systems, and uh, that's not even including the toy chips and stuff. Because I, I write a lot of music for kids' toys. Um, and we have loads of different hardware platforms for those that are full of limitations and lovely technical <laughs> restrictions. So, like, what what was what was that process like for you? Just kind of you know transitioning to this different type of songwriting. Did it come naturally, or yeah, it was it was actually really satisfying, really enjoying. I mean, it, the the programmer Mo, he had a he had a, he had a rough selection of files that he tunes that he wanted to sound like, because um, he's like I, th I think this covers a the the main premise was we wanted it to sound like uh, each song was from a different style of music a, a, a different genre, so that if we came back we could do DLC packs you know one for rock music one for classical music and stuff, and uh, I, I always like to think of the game as like Beat Saber for people that don't want to stand up all the time. <laughs> if you want to just sit down and spin around in your chair, it's really quite fun. Um, I, I really enjoy the game. Um, but it, it was the first time I'd written songs. So uh, I just kind of let the... It, I would start writing the tunes, and then uh, I would start writing the words to, to match the music. Um because I, I was trying to do it the other day with a, a friend of mine. We were trying to co-compose something. And I was struggling because he had written some words and he wanted me to put it to music. And it's like, ah, oh, I usually work the other way around. I start the music and then get the, you know, the feel of the music from that. So, uh, but yeah, the, 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 the singing and stuff, uh, it, it's all actually synthetic voices. Oh, I would have never and, known that. No humans involved, just me. I was going to ask, did you work, did you come up with the vocal melodies or did you work with a singer on, you know, did they get some input? But that's, that's wild. What kind of software did you use for that? It's actually called Synthesizer V. Um, it, it, it's kind of like, remember how voc Vocaloid mm -hmm. software, um, which, you know, 10, 15 years ago, we were all super excited about Vocaloid. And then you download a copy of it and you're like, oh, this sucks. It <laughs> doesn't sound realistic at all. But the synthesizer V sounds great. Um, I mean, it's not without its limitations in places. Um, 
you know, you can't really belt or, you know, that have them scream words and stuff or, you know, there's, there's not a ton of inflection in there. But if you want, uh, you know, a voice to sing your song and sound like a human singing it, it's a great piece of software. That's crazy. I would have, <laughs> I would have, I had all these other ideas in my mind about the session and how, what that may have looked like. Um, wow. That's, yeah, sorry, I'm just kind of like thinking about the possibilities there. That's very cool. Yeah, well, I mean, that Love Me and Leave Me track, I mean, the, the, the first thing I did was I thought, well, it'd be fun to have some backing singers. So I I, yeah. I laid down the doo-wop doo-wops and I thought, that sounds pretty, pretty damn good. <laughs> well, it does. So I'm going to have someone sing on top of this that we even bear. That's crazy. I, uh, I, got, I was able to get an A on every course in the game except for, I think it's called... Is it called record? Spin. Spin. Maybe. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Cause you're, and there's a part where you're kind of like imitating a turntable as you play. I could not go fast enough on the spins to get through that course. <laughs> I'm the same. I struggle with it, but I had a buddy over who loves all these movement games and I sat and watched him on the ch chair and he's spinning around hitting every single note. I'm like, God damn. That's <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. Do, do you, do you play any other VR games? Are you kind of checking that out at all? I mean, yo, I love VR. I, it's such an immersive technology. I played all the way through Half Life Alex. Mm. Uh, I was fighting with Darth Darth Saber. Uh, not Darth. What's his name? Darth Vader. Darth Vader. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was, my wife's. <laughs> I'm standing in the living room with a, you know with a, <laughs> the Quest headset on, t talking shit to Darth, Darth Vader, and my wife's going, well, "Who are you talking to?" <laughs> Those are good games. I've also really enjoyed uh, the Resident Evil 4 port they did. It's super hot. Um, I, I'm curious, like... There's been there's been so many attempts at VR. You know, was was did you ever, in your time, like, working around games and everything, like, did it ever feel like, oh, maybe this will start to happen, you know? Well, we did. The, the, there was a Virtual Boy game I worked on briefly. Oh, really? Yeah, t uh, Tanks, I think it was. It never got finished or released, but it was. It was. It just had that depth perception, you know, which was nice. I mean, VR always looked great. The idea was great. I remember seeing demos uh, of Amiga stuff. I think it was back then. Um, they had some souped-up Amiga hooked up to a VR headset, but it was still, you know, it was like one frame every couple of seconds or something. Mm. It wasn't nowhere near what we have today. What we have today is amazing. I mean, I, I picked up a Quest 3 at Christmas and I was like, oh my God, this is so good. <laughs> even even just the, the first encounter, you know, with the little aliens coming through the walls and stuff. It's like, that's incredible. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I'm enjoying it. I got a Quest 1 a while back and upgraded to a Quest 2 and there was a deal and it, it came with the Resident Evil 4 remake and that was kind of like a big selling point. I love, I love the... Uh, I love that game, the Resident Evil 4 game. And uh, it's it's been interesting to like kind of try to turn people on to VR. There's it, there's such a wide range of reactions to it, which I've never seen with with gaming. Usually people they they go, oh, you know, they're they're either into games or they're not. You know, maybe they're more casual or less, but VR, like, there's just this wide range. I don't know, you know, it's interesting to see how it how it could grow trying to account for the way that even people have different physical reactions to it. Yeah, well, I, th I think the motion sickness is a real hurdle in that. Um, it frustrates the hell out of me. I get motion sick. Uh, you know, roller coaster simulators and stuff. I played no... I, I like No Limits. I've played around with that on the PC a lot, and I put that on the VR headset, and immediately you put it on, and you're like, oh, my God. Your brain just, just freaks out. Yeah, I... I, I've noticed that some games do better. Like even Swivel has like a gentle mode, which I, I noticed was easier on me because I mean, at points like, you know, I, it's not a hardcore game at all. It's a very arcadey type kind of fun pick up and play game. But the movement does get pretty intense at points. And it was nice that there was like a an option to kind of ease up. <laughs> I went back and forwards with Mo in this a bunch of times because, you know, he'd, he'd send me the latest version of the game and I'd sit and play it. And I was like, Mo, this is insanely difficult for <laughs> For someone my age to do, I just, it's a lot of work. I just want to, you know, I had a gentle mode or something. So he, he finally caved in and just 
Because he, he sat and played it, you know, ev every day for the last, you know, six months or a year while he's working on it. And yeah, I mean, I played all eight courses this morning just to kind of prep and, and think about it more. And uh, I, I definitely broke a sweat, even though I'm kind of just, I'm just sitting. <laughs> but It's fun. You get a little workout from it. It's, yeah. Uh, Keep showing your toes. Which, which, uh, which tune did you like the best? Which one? I think my favorite one was probably Sputnik. Really? Which, um, which I, I, I think I saw in your band camp was like an older track, but, uh, yeah, I also really enjoyed, uh, the Sweet Tooth track. I liked that one. That was fun to do. That was, uh, just something completely different. Just, yeah. And then, and then to know that that's not a, you know, that's a synthesized voice is also crazy. Cause I, I mean, I was, <laughs> I was like, oh, is this the same singer from before? It sounds kind of different. And. <laughs> it, it, it sounds so breathy because it's you know down low and, and and you and you can set the the intensity of their singing somewhat. So for that, I, I set it to uh, breathy or gentle or whatever it was. That's so wild. I'll have to mess around with that. That sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah, it is. It was. It's totally worth buying. I, it was an instant purchase for me. It was. Do you think you'll continue to kind of work the lyrics and the voices into future compositions? Yeah, I think. I mean, I'm. I'm hoping that we can get some uh, players on uh, swivel so we can uh, write some more tracks for it, do some DLC or just bonus tracks. I could tell you a little backstory about the so the uh, that spin track. Yeah, please. So when we first started writing it, he wanted something that sounded like Ramstein, which if you're familiar with them, they're this wonderfully heavy metal German band. Yes. And so I thought, you know what? I'm going to sing on that one. <laughs> because when the kids had their Xbox and uh, was it Garage Band or something, I could, uh, uh, you could play uh, Du Hast okay. on that and you could sing along with it and stuff and it would give you a score at the end of it. And so I could score ninety eight percent singing "Do Hast" <laughs> on that. So I thought, right, I'm going to have a go at singing this. Just to... it's, it's so. So I originally wrote a song. It was it was kind of a tongue in cheek song called uh, "I Don't Speak German." <laughs> okay. And, and that opened up the chorus where I could say nine, just like Ramstein, you know. Right. Uh, but it, I I'm a terrible singer. I can't sing. I wish I could so bad. Oh my god, what I would give to be able to sing. But uh, so when I was doing that, I was also messing around with uh, artificial intelligence, uh, voice morphing technology. So you could take my voice. So what I was doing was I would record me singing it badly and then I would auto tune the hell out of it. And, you know, I'm going through adding, trying to add vibrato to parts where I sang it flat and stuff. And, and then I would morph it into another voice. Um, I actually ended up using Arthur from Red Dead Redemption 2's voice. <laughs> wow. So, uh, and, and it didn't sound too bad in that because he's quite, he's got quite a nice gruff voice too. So, but in the end, the song, I, I felt the song was kind of tongue in cheek uh -huh. and a little jokey, you know, and it, it just didn't sit right with the game. I, I didn't think it. So we ended up, ended up rewriting the lyrics and putting a different vocal line on there, but singing nostalgically about old records and yeah <laughs> spinning uh, another thing i want to ask you about was as you know you know going through the decades that you were working on music for different games um what was there ever much of uh in your experience whether personally i guess personally and also in you know people around you that you were working with um, much of an eye on preservation. We we were always looking what we doing next week. What's coming up the week after that? It's you know because you, you're constantly focused on trying to keep yourself busy working. You know it's what's next. That makes sense. I, I I've talked to a lot of people now about you know people that have worked in the industry in, in different different fields, and it, it it is surprising to me how how ephemeral everything really was and I, I i remember that even as a when i was you know as a kid gaming i kind of i had no problem just cashing out and going okay dumping the old system got to buy the new one and completely abandoning you know entire libraries of games to go hey I, I need the new thing um yeah and it seems like you know that i had an anecdote from someone recently who uh <laughs> he was saying he had all these 
archival news tapes. And anytime Nintendo needed footage for, you know, a presentation, documentary, commercial, whatever they're doing, they had to literally borrow these tapes from him because they had no press archives. They, they didn't keep anything they ever did, which is, you know, you think of these like monolithic entities in gaming that just, you know, there was never, never an eye on that, which is, uh, I've got videotapes in the garage that my wife keeps finding. She'd come in with this videotape. What's this? And, you know, we'll check it out. And it's a, a demo reel from, you know, a company 20, 30 years ago, just of the bits of their games, or it's a, a press release or intro video for something that I love that stuff. I'm a nerd for that kind of stuff. I, I've been getting more into, uh, Digita- di- digitizing VHS tapes and other other sources, other analog sources, and it's been a big rabbit hole. Uh, yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> trying to do it well, um, but it's so interesting how much stuff is kind of just in a garage somewhere, and maybe someone will come across it, maybe not. And if they do, you know, do they have the means to uh, to share it, or you know, or even the desire to? Tried to keep uh, an archive of everything I've done over the years, and it, it just grows though so ex- exponentially. I mean, you can see the piles of old hard drives over there. Mm-hmm. Those are all, you know, one, two, ten, twenty, forty gigabyte hard drives that, you know, you just filled over the years. On a similar note, like, was there ever any sort of, uh, you know, affection for older? methods and older platforms as you moved forward or was it still the kind of thing where you're just kind of just ready to move on to something more advanced the new and shiny was always more attractive than the old i mean for us i mean going from 1986 to 1992 or so i mean you were going from a commodore 64 to cd and even then the cd production levels i mean we were we had a pile of synthesizers we didn't have any proper mixing or mastering gear you know we don't have any of the plugins and stuff that we have these days uh just to help engineer all better so i mean that i've got an old game soundtrack from 1992 that was never released and it was uh it was a game called uh epic for motion software there was a an amiga release and a pc release i think but we never uh, we, we we were working on a cd rom version and so we wrote a full CD soundtrack for it, and that was our first one, and we were all super excited to do that. But it just it never got released. So we've got this soundtrack of badly recorded MP3s from, you know, 30 years ago. Man. Such a shame. What What are your thoughts on, on a sort of... I've seen, you know, more of a resurgence lately of a lot of classic soundtracks getting pressed to vinyl, um... And and release is doing fairly well, even like kind of like niche, like enthusiast kind of releases. Um, you know, I'm. How do you feel about that? You see these vinyl releases of some obscure Japanese porn game, yeah. And, uh, the soundtrack, and you're like, people are buying enough of this to justify making the vinyl. That's crazy. Yeah. But apparently, it sells. So. I think, it, it, you know, there's people that collect things. They, they want to collect the physical item. In this digital age, it's, it's nice to have something physical in your hand. And I, I haven't, I mean, I, I, uh, I was going to do the Horizon Chase 2 soundtrack. I need to make CDs up for that. Um, and I was thinking of doing it for the, the Swivel soundtrack as well. Mm-hmm. Just so people can have a physical thing to to buy and hold. I don't know if it'll sell or not. You know, that that's the risk. I, you know, I'm going to end up spending several hundred dollars and have a couple of boxes in my garage of CDs for the rest of my days. <laughs> yeah. Let alone vinyl. I mean, the thing with vinyl is it's, it's kind of interesting. I mean, if you're, if you're going to buy five or 10,000 uh, vinyls, they're like a uh, pennies each. But if you're only going to get one or 200, they're like 50 bucks each. Yeah. Like, oh my God, that's so expensive. Yeah. I'm, I'm going through that myself right now with a, an album I'd like to press up and it's kind of just like trying to find, Where's the realistic number of what we could sell versus, you know, uh, the production cost? But then it's really satisfying to have that physical object in your hand. I mean, I mean, the 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 idea behind that spin track was talking about that. Just the just ha- having those old records. I mean, 
think of the hours that you spent pouring over the artwork on vinyl covers and stuff. Totally, yeah. I mean, or looking for the little messages on the inside of the vinyl scratched into it. Yeah, the the sort of more you know, I don't mean to be overly nostalgic, but the 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 having the tactile experience with 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 games too. I mean, just reading the manual and then games that come with the different feelies and things like it's I know that sometimes there's a like a $300 special edition with some nice extras, but just, you know, to, to have a game where you go, oh, I, I have, you know, this where the experience extends beyond the screen or beyond the speaker is something that I uh, I know a lot of other people are missing, but I, I do think about that quite a bit. There's definitely something to it. Plus, it looks good on a shelf. I mean, we you know, people have a lot of shelf space, nothing on them. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, It's funny, too, to hear these, like, some of these older soundtracks get pressed because as a kid, I would... I would just play the games and sometimes just get to the point where the, with the track I wanted to hear and then just let it run. And, and so I could take it in because there was no other way to hear. I mean, Nintendo did a couple CDs you can get through their catalogs. And I think more of them came out in Japan than in the States. But it, it wasn't anything that I, I until, you know, in the last decade or so really saw much of a physical release. And there was just no other way. Like some, once I got a little more tech savvy, I would run songs and make little mixtapes, you know, running from my system into a deck. But even that's, yeah. you know, going through a lot of a lot of work. It doesn't sound quite quite right uh, coming from the the tape as it does coming through the television speakers. We used to get CDs made when we're when was when it was at Origin Systems. I remember us making CDs, uh, just a compilation of music, uh, and it was just for the employees for part of the Christmas. It was a Christmas giveaway thing at there. Hmm. Christmas party, every employee would get one, things like that. And at Atari as well, we did uh, for for Gauntlet Legends or sorry, Gauntlet Dark Legacy. Um, Mike Henry spent you know a few days just putting together the final masters for a, a soundtrack CD, which of course the CD never get made, so that soundtrack still just sitting there. Damn. <laughs> and then you put these soundtracks on. I mean, there was a game I worked at on Boss Game when I was at Boss Game Studios. Uh, it was a game called Kill Team. It was a. Uh, it was it's supposed to be a Hitman style game, but it was ultra violent, and we we could never find a publisher for it because it was just too violent. Nobody wanted to publish it. It's kind of like uh, what was that game? Several years later, um, they had the wee actor do the voice acting. Ah, mm. I can't remember anything. But I, I published the soundtrack, but people have no connection to that soundtrack because they've never heard it. So, right. I mean, for me, it was another six months of my life listening to this stuff every day, but it's nobody else has heard it and nobody wants to buy it. So just sit still. I listened to that recently, actually. And oh, what what was the source of the uh, the vocal samples that were throughout those tracks? <laughs> I don't know if I could say it without getting sued. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> there was a preacher. Uh, there was. A, I was watching TV one night. You know, just flipping through the stations, and there was this preacher, and he was just spewing this hatred. He was so angry, and just. I thought, I'm having some of that. He just sounds so so angry with everything. So I recorded it and took the tape into work and sampled it up. That's funny. And uh, and and I, we did actually seek permission from him at the time to use the speech. And he said, no, and if you use it, I'll fucking sue you. <laughs> so we used it in every promotional video we did for the next six months. You know? <laughs> every every video we sent to people had that, some with his speech in it. I've sampled uh, something similar, the, the Reverend Peter Popoff. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll tell you his name after the interview. <laughs> Fair <but>. enough. <laughs> 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 yeah, I got a kick out of that. I I, I wasn't sure if it was something where, uh, you know, the samples were laid in or if the tracks were built around the samples. or. Well, that, again, that was just me trying. I mean, we had, now we're doing CD stuff. So it's like, well, I can do anything I want. So let's sample some stuff. And I had some live guitarists come in. And I did actually sing on one of the songs. It's terrible. Um, sound like Lemmy from Motorhead. <laughs> so... I going to like the CD era. Um, was that really just pretty much limitless in terms of you know what you could put into a game's music? 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, Spider, the video game on the PlayStation One. We've got, I've got little samples of the six million dollar man in the. You know, because we, we have it, it was a robot spider, so we, we have the technology. We can rebuild them, right? That's right. going in there. You know, it sets the mood. So, like, you know, working on something like Swivel, like, are there any kind of technical limitations anymore at this point for you know game soundtracks? Not really. No, I mean anything. You can have full orchestral. You can have rock music. You can have techno. I mean, that's what we tried to cover, and I'm getting all the different styles in there. Hmm. I mean, so yeah, so as as soon as you entered the CD era, it was pretty much, it was pretty much just full force. Yeah. It's just interesting because there's so many, there, I, you know, I, I follow a lot of indie developers and there's like a, there's a conscious effort to kind of like emulate the limitations of past hardware. Yeah, well, there's, there's that strong focus on melody because when you, when you started, we've only got three channels, you better have a melody in there, otherwise... You know, it's going to be in one ear and out the other. Uh, but then you know, when you've got, you can have any sound and any instrument. It's a, it, it's a lot of choice. And, and I think the easy choice for a lot of developers was to try and follow film footsteps. They all want these big orchestral soundtracks. And you end up with game soundtracks that you just, they're not memorable. You don't remember a damn thing about them. That's kind of what I was going to ask about is, yeah, I mean, they're, I've experienced that quite a bit where I, I finish a game. I couldn't tell you a damn thing about the music. Cause I mean, obviously it accentuates the mood and the moment it, it, yeah. it fits, but it's not, it doesn't stick with you. Yeah. There's no melody there. And when you think of, uh, uh, what was that PlayStation three and four game, uh, sack boy mm-hmm. thing, the, the wee characters, those had some wonderful little tunes melod- melodious tunes that had uh, they were catchy and stuff i thought that was a great soundtrack totally yeah and uh, yeah. the other one was uh, stronghold uh, the stronghold series of games those had some really strong me- melody strong pieces rather than ambient background music as you got toward that point you know in music and composition having more and more freedom you know, do you have any impressions of what that kind of, what that change was like? Did it change the way you were writing music as you had more opportunity to put more sounds in? Or were you kind of like always thinking about these things and just could only do so much? Well, I mean, for me, I always tried to write a piece of music that people would want to listen to outside of the game as well. I never just wanted to write ambient background stuff. And I've been trying to, I've got a project on just now that I was Try, uh, I'm supposed to write some very ambient background stuff because people will spend days in this one section of the game. Um, and it, it's hard to come up with something that isn't just, you know, some tones that change slightly or... Because that's that's about all you can do. I mean, if you have a if you have anything that's memorable, people it's going to get on people's nerves, so they're just going to turn it down. And mm-hmm. that, you've lost the game at that point, you know, you've... It is really quite challenging. And so I I ended up trying to write something that was just like a kind of a meandering piece that was, wasn't was focused on melody. It was just a gentle meander through on a little musical journey, if you will. And uh, when I talked to the, the guys that were doing the game, I was like, have you had any more ideas about what you would like for that part of the game? And they're like, we're still using that one piece you wrote six months ago. So, I don't know. He said, I haven't found anything I like better than it. So <laughs> Right. Um, so, when you started making music for games and started, you know, working on compositions, like, I, I've, I've read a bit about your background and kind of, it seemed like you were just kind of pitching stuff and seeing who might take it. And Yeah, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. All I know I knew that was I wanted to write music for games because that sounded cool. <laughs> So Rob Hubbard was doing it and Rob Hubbard was a god to me. So were you, you were a gamer first? Yeah. Yeah. I would love games. I mean, we're, I mean, I, I, I'm the last of that generation that grew up where we didn't have computers until the age of 12 or 13. And then all of a sudden you could change your, what was happening on your TV. I mean, that was unthought of for the previous 60 or hundred years. Totally. Did you have any like particular influences uh, musically outside of game music that you were kind of trying to, uh, you know, take cues from? 
Yeah, there's a lot of different inf influences from other places. I mean, obviously, I wanted to sound like other game musicians, but then I saw that they were copying other musicians at times. Um, it's like uh, Rob Hubbard, fantastic composer, but he borrowed a lot of ideas from Larry Fast. Um, Martin Galway on the Commodore 64, he would... Uh, there was he put a whole Jean Michel Jarre piece in one of their games. I uh, just note for note copied it with no license or care about copyright at the time. Ben Doglish again, he was doing similar things with uh, references to uh, War of the Worlds and stuff. And, mm -hmm. and so uh, for me at the time, I was just starting to compose and I, I was finding it so hard to come up with the original ideas. And so I ended up uh, just starting to copy it in someone else's tune and then embellishing it and adding stuff to it and that was where I, this was my second or third game that i got published at that and that's i i had a very similar experience kind of growing up learning how to play music kind of just you know tinkering with someone else's ideas until i learned oh hey i can kind of move these parts around and you start to get you get the hang of it it's also funny how much older pc game music especially is <laughs> kind of just unlicensed uh, reinterpretations of popular tunes. You have to remember the pressure that everybody was under too. I mean, the the schedules were super tight. I mean, you didn't have, I mean, your, your game development cycle was two or three months for a whole game back then. It wasn't like you have years and hundreds of man hours or, and you had one composer to do everything. So I'm sure it was different, you know, scenario to scenario, even with different publishers maybe, but what kind of materials were you given when you were asked to compose? Like, were you always getting a game or did you sometimes just have to go blind? Oh, there was some, I mean, the, the worst one was probably, it was about four o'clock on a Friday and someone came into my office and says, hey, we've got a company on the phone that needs some music. And if you can get something done by five o'clock, the game will ship with music. If not, <laughs> so I was like, well, fuck, I better get writing then. <laughs> And that's it. That, that was I knew nothing about the game. Well, what's it called? You know, I knew the name of the game, and that was it. <laughs> I mean, that, other times you have, you know, it, you have enough time to, to to go in and really take care of a piece and massage it, produce it better, and um. But yeah, that, that that's more these days. You have time for that. Yeah, like Horizon Chase. Uh, Horizon Chase One I had uh, a lot of time on that. Um, but even that was only like three months, I think, two or three months. I think it was it was two months composing, and then another month doing all the mixing and stuff. That's interesting. Do you do it? Uh, do you do you handle like the mixing and, and mastering process for those things? Yeah, yeah. Usually, I mean, for Horizon Chase Two, we had uh, Paolo do everything. Um, just because they they, they they wanted to have him act as a producer, I think they just wanted to play with my tracks. They, they wanted me to write the music, and then they could fuck around <laughs> with them a bit. And that's pretty much what they did. So it was, it, it worked out well. That's cool. Um, well, I mean, that's the majority of my questions here. I don't know if you have any other things you want to just share or, you know. What sequence are you working in just now? Um, I, I, I use uh, FL Studio. Yeah, nice piece of software. I, I, I've been using it for about, I, I don't know, 10 or more years, I think now. Yeah, and it's one of those pieces of software. People get insanely fast with it. They get very proficient. and yeah. Once you know all the hook keys and stuff, boom, you can wait. Yeah, that's the thing. I've, I've tried to, you know, move on to some other things that might be a little more versatile or, you know, a little more well-regarded. But, uh, yeah, after after like a decade of working in it, I just, it, it, it's like I see the music in it. <laughs> you know, I can't, I, I've, try, I've tried to dabble in some other, other software and uh, even, even like, you know, like uh, I've emulated some old trackers, um, and it just doesn't it doesn't click with me in the same way. No. And and part of it too is that I started by instead of um you know typing anything out, I I, I draw the notes for the most part. And mm -hmm. I I kinda I don't know, the way I, I hear it, I'm I kind of see it. So it, it's it's so much faster for me to kind of just draw it with my mouse than it is for me to do anything else. See, I I find using the mouse slows me down so much. I can just lay it down on my keyboard. That's so interesting. Somebody once referred to it as a, uh, being like in the Matrix with all the, the characters 
fall and then cascading and stuff. And it's interesting too because I, I, you know, the appeal to me of of uh, other trackers is, is that it seems like you can get so so nuanced with every single note. Well, the more time you spend on it, the more time massaging it and just making very slight adjustments can make such a world of difference. Yeah, that doesn't come as naturally to me on a, a in in the step sequencer that I'm using because it's kind of just you know I can change the velocity and the timing a little bit, but that that's about it. Like the, you know, I, I I can add effects afterward, but it seems like you know some of the trackers I've dabbled in, you can individual effects on each, on, each, on, on on any one note, which is it, it opens things up to such a degree. Yeah, yeah, Renoise has some features like that where you can. You can go down a rabbit hole of adding little subgroups of notes that play when you hit something and stuff. It's like, oh my god, that's. I would, I would rather just program them in than. <laughs> Is Renoise what you use mostly? Yeah, yeah, I love Renoise. I mean, the it, ever since I got it, the day one. I mean, I've bought a couple of copies of it. It was that good. Um, just want to make sure I support the developers. Um, but every time you run into an issue, like. Oh, if only I could have you know video synced on a second monitor and have it uh, changing. If, if if I could link the 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 value of the chorus somehow to the distortion that's been played or the clipping of the waveform, there's always some way to do it already built into it. It's it's like they thought through everything possible. That's cool. It's cool too when you're able to actually. I don't know. It's it, from what I've read on it. At least it seems like the developers are present <laughs> you know well they're, they're german as well so you know it's precise yeah the, the only one thing it doesn't have that uh, bothers me a little bit is side chaining oh uh, it can't do side chain compression i you know i i find that that's uh, a limitation in a lot of software i use now you can do it i mean there are ways to do it because you can assign a value to so it, it when it detects the kick drum plays you can it'll lower the volume on the bass and stuff and which is just what side chain is anyway but it's not natively done in the program, right? Yeah, I, I've. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's funny. I because I I uh, did some hip hop stuff. I do sometimes they want like a a, a very certain side chain compression on the drums that it's a yeah. very particular sound, and I came to realize like I don't know how to do that uh, quickly and easily. Like I, I can I can set it up, but n like no DAW or anything I've used or has had just like a. You know, like a setting, basically. I, I struggle with the end result, you know, because it just feels that pressure on your ears, the dun wah, yes. wah, wah, and that drives me nuts. So I, I tend not to use it. Yeah. Or if I do, very sparingly. Yeah, same here. <laughs> well, hey, this has been a good chat. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to me. Uh, thanks for taking the time. Appreciate it. Okay. Well, thank you for listening in on that or watching if you did i try to put a few little visual things in there for you if you're one of the people who actually watches the videos and doesn't just listen anyway uh we covered a bunch of topics including that game swivel and he did put me in touch with mo the lead developer on that game and i had a chat with him recently about vr development and kind of where we're at with vr I think it's a really interesting talk that we had, and that will be coming out very soon here on Hidden Machine. So keep an eye out for that. And if you know anyone in the gaming sphere who I should talk to, or maybe you're someone who would like to chat with me about a project you're working on and your feelings about games, uh, hit me up. Let's talk about it. You can hit me up in the email or there's a Discord link down there. There's lots of ways to get in touch. It's not that hard, okay? Now, I could keep going on for a long time. I'm very lonely, but I'm just going to end this now so I don't say anything that I have to edit out later. All right? Peace.